you think your job is the worst. Check out these 10 jobs that will make you glad that you don't have one of them. I gagged multiple times while researching this list. Let's hope you haven't eaten anything as we get things started with number 10. Number 10. Executions were gory, disgusting public affairs which could last days at a time. Being roasted alive in metal bowls, death by tiny cuts, slowly being sawed in half, having your limbs ripped off, all that sort of poetry. Speed or mercy weren't our priorities at least until the French Revolution. Now, imagine the poor soul who had to clean up the mess, the one who had to pick up the burned chunks of human flesh, who had to fish out the leftover pieces from the foul water they were slowly boiled in, the person who had to pick through the excrements, filth, and blood associated with human death. Number 9. Tanners mostly used sheepskin and cattle hides, but hunters and fishermen were able to supply other types of skin such as walrus, seal, moose, deer, and bear. Tanning mills were powered by wind, water, or animals. The tanning process had many steps. First, skins were soaked and softened in a lime pit, which burned off animal hair and flesh debris. Then, to neutralize the effects of the lime, the skins were washed with chicken droppings diluted in water. The washed hide which oozed with gelatin was combined with tannic acid to toughen a hide into leather. Tree bark was the source used for the tannin. Black oak produced the best form of tannin with white hemlock a close second. Huge was the solution made up of ground up bark and water. It would keep the hides from rotting, making the outer surface impenetrable and slowing the interior from tannage. The tanner had to be quite knowledgeable because he had to know how much tannin to add to the chemical process. If too much tannin was added, the leather could be deemed useless because it was too hard. If not enough tannin was added, the leather might break up because lime still remained on the hide. Can you imagine the combined stink of rotting flesh and feces? Number 8. A tosher is someone who scavenges in the sewers, especially in London during the Victorian era. It was a common sight in 19th century for whole families to open a manhole cover and go down into the sewers, where they would find rich pickings. As most toshers would reek of the sewers, they were not popular with the neighbors. Toshers entered into the filthy sewers looking for valuable items such as copper coins or gold to sell. Toshers in London sewers were at risk of suffocation from breathing in pockets of noxious fumes or foul air. Sometimes when the sluice were lifted, a rush of water entered the sewers posing a risk of drowning in excrement. And the most feared threat, rats. Swarms of rats hid in the dark shadows waiting to attack. The rodents were rampant in Victorian cities. Toshers used a variety of tools for the job as well as carrying lanterns for the dark tunnels and a pan for sipping raw sewage from valuable items. Toshers carried a pole around which was seven or eight feet long with a large iron hole on the end. This vital tool was used in case a tosher sank into a quagmire, enabling him to attach to something solid to pull himself out. It could also be used to dig through rubbish and uncover the treasure they were looking for. Toshers wore long coats with large pockets for holding the items they collected, canvas trousers, and old slots for shoes. They also wore a canvas apron and carried a bag on their side for their found treasures. Number 7 no one knows exactly when gut was first used for musical strings. Legend has it that Apollo was the first string maker. When he came across the tortoise and had the inspiration to make the first lyre, he used the poor animal's own intestines for the strings. The first actual proof of the use of gut strings came in 1823 when Burton discovered some of the earliest extant musical instruments in the tombs of Thebes. These harps had gut strings that, according to his account, still made a tone after some 2,000 years in storage. Obtaining the gut from the animal was one of the most unpleasant aspects, but the lengthy intestines then had to be cleaned and treated with saw for preservation, which could also prove messy and smelly. The string maker would then soak the guts in water and in an alkaline solution, usually made from potash. The chemical contents of these solutions would have an impact on the stiffness of the resulting strings. So this part of the process was crucial in determining how the violin would later sound. It would also have an impact on the color of the final string. Following the winding and drying processes, strings were colored, polished, and finished before being fitted onto instruments for use. We are on our way to number six, but before we get there, don't forget to click that subscribe button.
then like our video and share it with your friends, it helps the channel out and lets us know you like us, thanks for watching. Number 6. A scene eater is a person who consumes a ritual meal in order to spiritually take on the sins of a deceased person. The food was believed to absorb the sins of a recently dead person, thus absolving the soul of the person. Scene eaters, as a consequence, carried the sins of all people whose sins they had eaten. They were usually feared and shunned. Following a death often an unexpected one, scene eaters were summoned to the deceased's home. There, their family handed the scene eater a few dollars and led them to the corpse. As the family watched, the scene eater would pick up food left on the dead person's chest. The food, usually bread or a pastry, was believed to have absorbed the deceased's unconfessed and lingering sins. While sitting on a stool and facing the door, the scene eater ate it, taking on the sins for himself. I give easement and rest now to thee, dear man, the scene eater would say. Come not down the lanes or in our meadows, and for thy peace, I pawn my own soul. Amen. Afterwards, the person's family often chased the scene eater from their home with sticks while shouting abuse. Number 5 During the Industrial Revolution, match girls were young girls 4 to 16 years old that made matches. They made them by dipping the ends of the match sticks into a harsh, toxic chemical called phosphorus. This chemical was poisonous, so many girls developed fossy jaw, a bone cancer that literally disintegrated pots of the jaw. When a girl got fossy jaw, her face near the jaw gave off a green glow and slowly turned black. The jaw would soon start to give off smelly pus, and eventually the girl would die from the cancer. Match girls worked long hours in the factories usually from 6 rim to 6 p.m. with only two short breaks. They were not allowed to talk or even sit down while they worked otherwise they would be fined or fired. The girls only made four shillings a day, but they were also heavily fined if they dropped a match, talked to each other, sat down, arrived late, or went to the bathroom without permission, sometimes they went home with no pay at all. Beatings were not uncommon at the factories as well. Number 4 A flatulist or professional farter is an entertain often associated with a specific type of humor, whose routine consists solely or primarily of passing gas in a creative, musical, or amusing manner. There are a number of scattered references to ancient and medieval flatulists who could produce various rhythms and pitches with their intestinal wind. St. Augustine mentions some performers who did have such command of their bowels that they can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. Wanawis Vives, in his 1522 commentary to Augustine's work, testifies to having himself witnessed such a feat, a remark referenced by Michael Montaigne in an essay. The professional farters of medieval Ireland were called Brage Tour. They are listed together with other performers and musicians in the 12th century Ecmid Quar, a diagram of the banqueting hall of Tara. As entertainers, these brage toy ranked at the lower end of a scale headed by birds, Philly, and harpers. Joseph Pugil was a French flatulist and entertainer. He was famous for his remarkable control of the abdominal muscles, which enabled him to seemingly fart at will. Some of the highlights of his stage act involved sound defects of cannon fire and thunderstorms, as well as playing O Sol Mio and La Marseillaise on an ocarina through a rubber tube in his anus. He could also blow out a candle from several yards away. His audience included Edward, Prince of Wales, King Leopold II of the Belgians, and Sigmund Freud. Number 3 You think you hate picking up after your dog? Be glad you are not a pure finder. This job involved collecting dogs' feces which doubtlessly littered the streets of London. Dog's dung was known as pure because of its cleansing and purifying properties and was sold on to tanneries where it was used, principally, in the manufacture of leathers such as Morocco's and Rome's. The dung removed all the moisture from the skin and the unpleasant odors associated with the natural skin. Being a pure finder was a lucrative occupation as the tanneries in Bermondsey were voracious users of the stuff. They sold the dung on by the stable bucket load. Dry limey dung fetched the highest price at some yards because of its high alkaline content which made it a more effective purifying agent. Other yards, however, had a preference for the dark, moist sort to satisfy the requirements of the latter type of customers. 
your finders were not averse to adopting what might be termed tricks of the trade and adulterating what they had collected. Tools of the trade consisted of a handle basket, usually with a cover, to hide the contents and a black leather glove for the right hand. Many pure finders, however, dispensed with the glove on the basis that it was easier to wash their hands than to keep the glove fit for use. Number 2. In the 1500s, the King of England's toilet was luxurious. A velvet cushion, portable seat called a close stool, below which sat a pewter chamber pot enclosed in a wooden box. Even the king had one duty that needed attending to every day, of course, but you can bet he wasn't going to do it on his own. From the 1500s into the 1700s, British kings appointed lucky nobles the strangely prestigious chance to perform the king's most private task of the day. As the groom of the stool, instructions from 1452 in the Book of Nurture for the office off a chamber lane, which included a little rhyme to help new grooms to the task. See the privy house for easement be fair, sweet, and clean, and that the boards thereupon be covered with cloth fair and green, and the whole himself, look there no board be seen. There on a fair cushion, the or jure no man to vex. Look there be blanket, cotton, or linen to wipe the nether end. And ever he calls, wait ready and prompt, basin and ewer, and on your shoulder a towel. In the fancy, wealthy days of the Tudors, just getting ready to use the stool took some work, as many people donned multiple layers of fine garments in their daily lives. The groom of the stool might help with loosening those clothes and then whisking away the waist. Sources vary on whether the groom actually helped the king clean himself after the deed was done, or just handed him a cloth, but there's no doubt about his importance to the head honcho's daily life. Number 1. A vomit collector, that's right, a person paid to gather people's puke. The Roman times were known for excess. Well, it was excessive for the emperors, senators, and other wealthy people that occupied the higher echelons of power. Occasionally regular people got to party too. Romans held festivals revolving around eating tons of food and overflowing wine. All these feasts and banquets, as well as the extravagance they showed, prompted the idea that Romans must have had rooms in which to relieve themselves. The poet Seneca said, guests often vomit so that they may, and eat so that they may vomit. And that is where the poor vomit collector comes in. The Roman vomit collector was tasked to come in and collect the receptacles full of puke. Guests just hurl to keep the party going. The guests either vomit into specially provided bowls or simply spew on the floor. The job of the puke collector is to go crawling around mopping up the vomit during parties unless the party guest was kind enough to vomit directly onto his face. However, most Romans didn't feel it was necessary to leave the dining room in order to vomit. 